Hello, this is Angelia, and you are listening to or watching the podcast, Why You Do What You Do, uh, the podcast that talks about human development and psychology to help you figure that out a little bit more. Um, and now last time we were talking about uh, observational learning, um, and now we're going to pick up uh, on perspective, cognitive. Um, so the cognitive perspective focuses us on thought processes and the behavior that reflects those processes. So the things you're thinking about it and how you behave uh, based on how you're thinking. This perspective encompasses both organismic and mechanically influenced theories. Um, so, you know, the two theories we talked about earlier... Mm -mm. It includes the cognitive stage theory of Piaget. I like that one. That's a good one. The newer information processing approach and neo Piagetian theories, which combine elements of both. And, you know, to the average person, this probably not going to mean ugh, buzz off bug name geez, anything. But, you know, it's good to learn about. Hope you kind of think about that a little bit. It also includes contemporary efforts to apply findings of brain research to the understanding of cognitive processes. Now, in case you didn't know that, when you study psychology, you do find about, uh, about the physical brain and how it works. So, you know, back in the day, it might have just been all philosophy stuff, but now there's some medicine involved in it. So if you think, you know, that you heard that from your grandparents or whatever, you know, they don't know what they're talking about, it's all philosophy. That's yeah, not true anymore. Um, I had to study about the structures of the brain and what they did and things of that nature. And so they do. So, you know, there's some medical science involved in psychology as well. <clears throat> it also concludes contemporary efforts to apply findings uh, in brain research to the understanding of cognitive processes, um, such as Vygotsky's theory, which deals largely on the social context of cognition and that we'll be uh, we'll discuss that later on. Jean Piaget's cognitive stage theory. Much of what we know about how children think is due to the Swiss theor theoretician Jean Piaget. Piaget's theory was the forerunner of today's cognitive revolution with its emphasis on mental processes. P.J. took an organismic perspective, viewing cognitive development as the product of children's efforts to understand and act on their world. Um, because that's what they want to do. They're, they come out into this big world. They want to understand what's going on um, and what can I do. Um, and we tweak that as we get older. You know, we want to know more. We watch the news. Um, we, we refine things that we're good at. You know, it's an ongoing process for pretty much all your life. PJ's clinical method combined observation with flexible questioning to find out how children think. PJ followed up their answers with more questions. In this way, he discovered that a typical four-year-old believed that pennies or flowers were more numerous when arranged in a line than when heaped or piled up. From his observation of his own and other children, P.J. created a comprehensive theory of cognitive development. And what that means is like a little kid, um, if you have like a line of pennies versus you just plop the pennies down in a pile, they think there's more in the line because it looks bigger to them. So to their young, immature brains who don't understand, you can't know until you count them, it looks like there's more because they're laid out taking up a bigger space. PJ believed that cognitive development begins with an inborn ability to adapt to the environment. Um, and that's what we all learn to do for good or bad. Uh, we learn to adapt to our environment. Um, and, you know, those who cannot adapt don't do so well. Um, and that's another a uh, little argument I like to throw in when I'm discussing evolution with people um, who don't believe in evolution uh, because according to them, you can't have God and evolution both. And I say that's ridiculous because God is a creator. 
uh, would have created um, organisms that could grow and adapt with their environment, right? He's not dumb, um, and that would be dumb. So, of course, God created evolution. By rooting for a nipple, feeling a pebble, or exploring the boundaries of a room, young children develop a more accurate picture of their surroundings and greater competence in dealing with them. And like I say, little, little babies, little kids, they're scientists. They're, they're trying to figure all this stuff out. <laughs> so, you know, if you can give them more experiences versus just kind of stick them in a corner or whatever, um, they're going to learn more and faster. Um, and that will lead to more intelligence later in life. P.J. described cognitive development as occurring in four qualitatively different stages. Um, and we might read them out later, which represent universal patterns of development. At each stage, a child's mind develops a new way of operating. From infancy through to adolescence, mental operations evolve from learning based on simple sensory and motor activity to logical abstract thought. Um, and so that takes a while, you know, from being a little, little kid and thinking that when you kick, you're making, you know, that curtain blow when really it's the wind or the fan or whatever, <laughs> laying in your baby bed, um, to, you know, being in a teenager who's trying to figure out what they want to do after high school. There's a lot of changes you go through in that development process. Cognitive growth occurs through the inter through three interrelated processes man my tongue ain't working today organization adaptation and equilibration organization is the tendency to create increasingly complex cognitive structure systems of knowledge or ways of thinking that incorporate more and more accurate images of reality um, because, like I say, as you get older, you understand more uh, about reality. Um, you know, when you're uh, a baby, you just think, you know, everything you did caused something. And as you get older, you learn there are laws and rules that govern the universe. And, oh, excuse me. And that uh, things work in a certain way. These structures, called schemes, are organized patterns of behavior that a person uses to think about and act in a situation. Uh, so everyone develops their own schemes or schemas. I've heard it both ways. Um, on how to deal with life. And that's based on all of your experience. Um, because you learn what you live. So, no two people are going to have the same way they deal with a certain thing. Um, now, they can be similar and, you know, that's how we usually make friends is when we see one person does things a certain way and we like to do it that way, too. You know, there's connection there. Um, or, you know, how we don't. We see one person do something. I would never do that. Um, and, you know, so then you're not as likely to like that person because they, they have different ways, you know. <laughs> as children acquire more information... Their schemes become more and more complex because, of course, the more you know, uh, the more you know that things are not so cut and dry and easy in the world. Uh, so you have to come up with um, ways of meeting expectations and goals in the world. An infant has a simple scheme for sucking, but soon develops varied schemes for how to suck at the breast, a bottle, or a thumb <coughs> because all are a little bit different um you know with the breast it's a little different a little easier um the nipple's a little harder and this thumb you certainly wouldn't want to you know kind of gnaw on that it's going to hurt you a little bit so they develop different ways you know of doing similar things at first schemes for looking and grasping operate independently uh, later infants integrate these separate schemes into a single scheme that allows them to look at an object while holding it. And I'll tell the story of one of my kids. Um, he had a teddy bear mobile. They were just cute little teddy bears with blue jeans on and then the others were panda bears. Um, he loved that thing. He'd watch that thing. Um, and of course he started trying to grab that thing. Well, 
as he got older and he could sit up, he tried to grab it, still couldn't reach it. Um, then when, you know, he would uh, be able to raise up, still couldn't reach it. He'd fall over sideways. Um, then we he could pull up a little bit. It was almost in his reach. But then when he could finally stand up on the side of his crib, he could then reach those bears. And he was so happy <laughs> to finally be able to reach those bears. <laughs> and, of course, once he could reach the bears, what we did was cut the cut them off the little string of the mobile and get rid of the mobile um, and give him those four little bears, put one in each corner. Uh, so he had these four little bears. They were only like this big. and might look big on the screen because my hand is looking huge. But um, maybe, you know, not even... Not even six inches tall, you know, uh, five inches, maybe four, that hung from his little mobile. So he learned, you know, from looking to grasping and, oh my goodness. So finally he was able to do what he wanted to do. Adaptation is PJ's term for how children handle new information in light of what they already know. Um, so everything you know it's kind of added to what you already know. Um, when you learn new things, you take that and take it in and apply it to things that you already know. If it's similar, if it's something different, um, then you create a new scheme for how to use this new skill. Um, again, like, you know, the thing in Shrek where, you know, you're, you're like an onion, you have layers. <laughs> All of us do. We all have layers. That we've accumulated over the years, um, excuse me, uh, to build ourselves as a person. Adaptation involves two steps. One, assimilation. Taking in new information and incorporating it into existing cognitive structures. And two, accommodation. Changing one's cognitive structures to include the new information. Well, basically what I just said a while ago. <laughs> E equilibration, that's a that's a word for my tongue. A constant striving for a stable balance or equilibrium dictates the shift from assimilation to accommodation. Um, because like I said, your brain likes homeostasis, it likes its middle ground, it likes being there. Um, so you know, it tries to figure out ways um to make things work, you know, and if New information uh, can be put into an already existing category. Your brain will do that. And if not, it makes another one. When children cannot handle new experiences within their existing cognitive structures and thus experience disequilibrium, they organize new mental patterns that integrate the new experience, thus restoring a more comfortable state of equilibrium. Um, because like I said, your brain, your brain, it likes to be cool, calm, collected, and likes this little happy midsection there. Um, if it's new, it's something new you got to learn. I'm sure all of us remember back to elementary school when we had to learn new things. It was upsetting. <laughs> Our brain's like, what is this? We just learned this. Now you give me this new information. What? You know, <laughs> life's hard. <laughs> A breast or bottle fed baby who begins to suck on the spout of a sippy cup is showing assimilation. And, you know, you all, you all, we all got to do it because, you know, if you suck on a bottle forever, your teeth are going to rot out. Um, you know, using an old spout of a sippy cup um, is a scheme to deal with a new situation um, because they're used to sucking and they know if they suck on this they'll get something it's the tilting part that gets to be hard I know um, uh, with my kids um, they start sucking before they even tilt and get the juice to their mouth and then sometimes if, you know the first couple times they try it on their own you know too much whoosh <laughs> so we have to learn and assimilate into our behaviors every new thing that we learn you know or our knowledge base and it's hard. It's hard growing up. That's hard work. You know, have some compassion and love for your kids because growing up is hard. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
When the infant discovers that sipping from a cup requires different tongue and mouth movements from those used to suck on a breast or bottle, she accommodates by modifying the old scheme. She has adapted her original sucking scheme to deal with a new experience, the cup. Like I said, remember back to when you were a little kid. It was hard growing up. Growing up is hard. Thus, assimilation and accommodation work together to produce equilibrium and cognitive growth. Um, because, you know, if you believe you can handle these things coming your way, um, you're more confident and you can accept things easier. Um, and that's how you learn and grow. Hmm. So itchy. Piaget's observations have yielded much information and some surprising insights. Who, for example, would have thought that mo most children younger than seven do not realize that a ball of clay that has been rolled into a worm before their eyes still contains the same amount of clay? Because um, again, remember, children think that the more space a thing takes up, the bigger it is. Even if they saw the ball and you roll it out, which is bigger, um, they should logically be able to say, well, they're the same size because that, that's where you got that from. But no, um, because that snake or worm, whatever you roll it out into, is bigger, taking up more long space lengthwise, they think that's bigger, it's taking up more space. <laughs> so it's a cognitive error the children make. And there's a lot of them that they make. We'll get into some more of those later on. Um, but, uh, you know, this will show you right there that a child's brain is not as sophisticated as yours. So, if you think it is, and the child should know this or that and the other thing, you're wrong. <laughs> you might want to adjust your theory. Or then an infant might think that a person who has moved out of sight may no longer exist. Um, and early on, that's kind of the thing. That's why they get sad and cry, you know, if they see you go away. Because it's like, well, they're gone. There's my help. There's my, you know, person who cares about me. They're just gone. <laughs> it's, it's hard being little. Piaget has shown us that children's minds are not miniature adult minds. Like I just said a while ago, keep that in mind. Your child's mind is not a little adult's mind. It is immature. Um, basically, when your kid is born, they're insane. <laughs> and by that, I mean the connections, the neurons and the connections do not exist yet in the higher mind. You know, they're pre-wired, the reptilian mind, uh, good to go. They've got neurons and things up there. But the more they learn, the more connections are made between these. Um, so, at first... Your kid is nuts. <laughs> and if you've ever had toddlers, you realize that. Because they will do crazy things that make absolutely no common sense and dangerous things. That's why you got to watch kids all the time. You cannot let your toddler be around. They will do crazy things and get themselves hurt. You know? Um, and as we get older, we learn more. And we make more connections in there. And we start to become more sane. <laughs> As we get older, you know, like I said, big kids aren't, you know, walking out in front of cars, putting their hand out, trying to stop the car like Superman or something crazy. Um, usually, <laughs> you know, so we learn a little more about our environment and how to be safe rather than just do impulsive things 24-7. Knowing how children think makes it easier for parents and teachers to understand them and teach them. So if you get that your little kid is not a miniature adult, that they have to learn everything from square one, then you can talk to them as you're doing something. Teach them as you're doing something. You know, um, like if they're watching you or you brush your teeth away and say, this is how we brush our teeth. We do this, we do this. And they might even want to try it too. And, you know, if they're really little, they're not going to do it, right? They're just going to be chewing on a toothbrush. That's fine. But you got them started, you know. Uh, if they walk in in a bathroom, you know, Oh, I'm using, I'm using the big potty. Maybe then they're going to be, well, I want to use the big potty too, you know? And then that's where you can start, you know? Things have a natural way of working out if you don't get hung up on certain ages. Because all these baby books, a lot of them, 
that you're going to look at um, are going to tell you this age you do this, this age you do this. You know what? It works 100% easier if you go with natural curiosity of the child. You know, uh, what they're interested in learning, what they're ready to do. And like I said, you can prompt that by teaching them. Every moment is a teaching moment. Um, if they see something and they're watching you, you see that they're watching you, you can explain this to them. Even if it's something way over their head, like balancing a checkbook. You know, you can say, oh, hi, I'm, I'm balancing the checkbook so I know how much money we have to pay bills and get gas and food. And then in their mind, they realize, oh, that's a thing. You know, so that maybe later on they might want to learn how to do that. So, like I say, every moment is a teaching moment. Yet, PJ seems to have seriously underestimated the abilities of infants and young children. Some contemporary psychologists question his distinct stages, pointing instead to evidence that cognitive development is more gradual and continuous. Um, like I said, Trying to fit every kid in a little box, you know, and this age, this, this age, this, it doesn't work. We all develop in different ways, at different speeds. Um, and like I said, um, you can have a lot easier time if you go with the kids' natural curiosities, natural abilities. Um, every child is different. And if you try to start putting them in a little thing, you know, like the square peg saying, you're just going to be disappointed and they're going to be frustrated and it's just not going to work out for y'all and that's a shame. Research beginning in the late 1960s has challenged Piaget's idea that thinking develops in a single, universal progression of stages leading to formal thought. Um, because that's how he felt, is that you take this step to this step to this step until you get to be uh, X years old and then you are capable of formal thought. Well... Not necessarily, because you have to learn this, you know, uh, fantasy thinking as, you know, a little baby and child, um, to um, reality-based thinking, uh, that's where you're understanding what's going on, to imaginative thinking where you understand reality, but you can also play in imaginary land, um, to, you know, cognitive thinking where you're actually using some common sense and critical thinking skills um, to figure stuff out. Instead, children's cognitive processes seem closely tied to specific content, what they are thinking about, as well as to the context of a problem and the kinds of information and thought a, excuse me, culture considers important. Um, because like I say, cultures are different. Different cultures value different things. Um, you know, a child in America might not care, you know, um, how much rain we have. But, you know, a child uh, living um, in Africa closer to the Nile, or, you know, the Middle East closer to the Nile, uh, might care if it rains a lot because they know there's going to be flooding. So, again... Your culture has an influence on what you're thinking about and what you're learning. Finally, research on adults suggests that Piaget's focus on formal logic as the climax of cognitive development is too narrow because he considers that's the goal. When you reach formal logic, critical thinking, which a lot of people say doesn't happen until like age 21 to 25 now, um, is the goal. That that's what you're striving for. And mentally speaking, maybe it can be. But also, you know, there are things like, you know, mental maturity. Um, having a good EQ as well as IQ. So, you know, um, basically, like I tell people, uh, like the little commercial, never stop learning. But that that's important to learn and develop as a person. Uh, to get the most out of life that you can. Um, I think now most people uh, are scientists, psychologists, philosophers, agree that that's kind of the goal, you know, to be, you know, able of logical thinking is good, <laughs> but <laughs> might not be the end all be all in the world, <laughs> you know. It does not account for the emergence of such mature abilities as practical problem solving, wisdom, 
and the capacity to deal with ambiguous situations and competing truths. Well, I basically just said that. <laughs> because, like I say, the world is different in all places. Um, so, you know, how you can't logic that out. You know, that is something that you have to have, you know, emotions for. Um, and you have to be able to, you know, be practical. Uh, you can't always go with the logical choice. Because sometimes that's not practical. That's not capable you're not capable of that in your situation or you know um that can't be brought about at this point in time um and again wisdom is subjective uh personally I, I feel like anything that brings you closer to your higher power is wisdom um and you know dealing uh with ambiguous situations because random stuff happens in the world that's a fact of life and if you don't have a good mindset or an emotional quotient in order to deal with that, life's going to kick your butt. That's just the facts of life. So, you know, you have to be able to deal with that on a mental and emotional level rather than get your butt kicked all the time. And competing truths, again, um, I'm a Christian, but I've studied uh, Buddhism. I've studied, you know, Islam uh, and several others that me. <laughs> but, you know... Sometimes there are competing truths in these things. You know, personally, I think um, Jesus can fit in with everything. Um, Buddhism is, as it's an attainment from, you know, the Prince Siddhartha Gama, um, not the, you know, sorry guys, not the more Asian big chubby guy that everything's cool with however you want to be. Um, that's a more, um, how do you put, put it nicely? That's a um, changed version of the Buddha from the original, you know, one from India. So, you know, he is not worshipped. Um, being a Buddha is a mental attainment. Um, and you do that by studying um, his words until you, you know, hopefully become uh, an enlightened being, a Buddha. Start out as a Bodhisattva, you know. Um, so that is not in competition with being a Christian, because you're studying these for your mental health. Um, but now, worshipping the Buddhist certainly would be. Um, and then it's okay if another uh, group of people had a prophet that was wise, um, and was leading them, you know, in a good way. Um, so, again, um, you have to decide what is something that competes with a truth that you feel, and something that doesn't, and Honestly, you're going to go with what feels right to you. Um, so, if there are people worshipping a god that's different from my god, I'm not going to be okay with that. I'm not going to be down with that. Um, but, you know, if they have a prophet that doesn't compete with mine, you know, I'm probably going to be, oh, that's, there's some value in that. That's cool. That's okay. So, you have to have the mental ability to accept things. Um, and... When you have the mental ability to accept, you also have the mental ability to reject. Um, so you have to know your own mind. The information processing approach. The newly information processing approach attempts to explain cognitive development by analyzing the processes involved in perceiving and handling information. So how you see the information and how your brain handles it, or if it does, handle it. <laughs> it is not a single theory, but a framework or set of assumptions that, un that underlies a wide range of theories and research. So again, uh, people were standing on stuff that other people already done and building up. The information processing approach has practical applications. It enables researchers to estimate an infant's later intelligence from the efficiency of sensory perception and processing. And generally, that's a general term because, again, um, you can play catch up. You know, you might not be interested in learning stuff as a young toddler and that might have to do with your home life. But then when you get to school and you're in a different environment um, and you like the kids at school, you know, or you like your teacher, you might be more inspired. Uh, to grow and learn more. So again, 
uh, anytime you have a theory, there are variables and, you know, sometimes you can poke holes in some things. Um, it enables parents and teachers to help children learn by making them more aware of their own mental processes and of strategies to enhance them. So if they find like a child is def def deficient blah, blah, in a certain area, then they can kind of give them uh, some work that uh, will help them to grow in that area. Um, you know, and that's why we have, you know, uh, exceptional child education um, to help children uh, who might have problems in this, that, or other to catch up, you know, uh, with the other kids um, and to be able to be successful adults because that's the goal. And psychologists can use information processing models to test, diagnose, and treat learning problems. Um, so, you know, if they're ever uh, telling you your child needs, you know, some testing, developmental testing, or educational testing, that's where they're going with that, is they want to figure out how your child does things, um, how does that compare to his peers, and maybe um, there might need to be some intervention. Um, and don't get upset with that, don't get defensive with that, because what they're trying to do is to help your child. Um, I got a little defensive at first, but then I saw, I went and observed my son's class and saw what the teacher was talking about. And I was like, yeah, I agree. This is not good. <laughs> this is a problem. Um, and so, you know, I agreed to let them help him. And they did. Um, and now he's a functioning adult. You know, he has a job making pretty good money. And he's doing something that he likes to be doing. Um, so, you know, he became successful. My other son uh, wasn't so good at school. He had a specific learning disability was not good at reading and writing and math and things like that. However, um, he was interested in hands-on work. Um, so we got him into a program, uh, you know, uh, success in the workplace kind of program. Um, and then they found out that the kid um, is uh, able to eyeball measurements within a one one thousandth of an inch. <laughs> so he fell into uh, job category where his skills were much needed um, and now he's got a great job so don't poo poo on the idea that your child has a problem let them do the testing and take any in in interventions needed because then your child can be more successful you know and if other kids uh, make fun of them or anything then basically who cares those kids are jerks and you tell your kid that, you know, screw them. Who cares what they think? You know, you don't have to say those words. You need to say, forget about them. <laughs> because it's them, your child, that matters the most, not what these other kids think. Um, and you should never be ashamed of your child. You should love your child and want to build them up, not tear them down. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop for today. And I hope that helped you think a little bit more about why you do what you do. Until next time.